Welcome to the NeuroStronger podcast, a podcast aimed to connect, inform, and inspire neurologically disabled children and their families. This is Vishnu Kagalanu, and in this episode, we will focus on disability justice and defending disability rights, disabled children's rights to learn and live as normal as possible. Today, we welcome Stephen Rosenbaum, the Frank C. Newman Lecturer at Berkeley Law, visiting researcher scholar in the Disability Studies Cluster of UC, Berkeley's Othering and Belonging Institute. Mr. Rosenbaum also taught civil and human rights law for disabled people at University of Washington and disability rights and justice at Stanford Law. Mr. Rosenbaum is a recipient of a Harvard Law Wasserstein Public Interest Fellowship and Eleanor Swift Award for Public Service. He has authored over 48 papers. His scholarship is on disability, special education, lay advocacy, international human rights, and legal education. Mr. Rosenbaum was senior litigation attorney with Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund and associate managing attorney with Disability Rights California. Thank you for joining us on the NeuroStronger podcast, Mr. Rosenbaum. Mr. Rosenbaum, you had an extensive career in defending human rights, including disability rights. There is a perception that society prevents persons with disabilities from exercising their economic and social rights compared to people without disabilities. Can you explain to our audience your experience defending disability rights? rights to learn and to live as normal as possible. Thank you, Vishnu. Thank you for this invitation, and this opportunity. Um, that's a broad question and an important one. I think the disability rights movement is one that uh, focuses on the whole person interacting with the environment. One often talks about the disabling factor is not so much a, a condition of the individual, mental disability, a physical disability. It's the environment which is disabling, which doesn't make it easy to negotiate that environment. And although we talk a lot in a physical sense, that's the easy way, the sort of poster child way to see it. Ramps to get into buildings, grab bars in toilets, um, narrow uh, doorways that are wide enough there's definitely the importance of that kind of physical access to space but there's a lot in society that the built environment makes difficult to negotiate and navigate and that's because for so many centuries um well first of all disabled people uh were not living that long uh you might have very early death uh, inability to thrive and survive at very early ages, uh, shortly after birth. And then, of course, for many periods, disabled people were hidden away. Shame from families, um, society's inability to confront disabled people because, again, disabled people didn't really fit into the environment, into normalizing. And beginning around the middle of the last century, 20th century, this notion of normalization began to take hold, particularly a lot of research and writing was done in Sweden. And although the word normal, we don't often like to use in the disability environment because it, it suggests just normality and abnormality. And there's many words about describing people with disabilities or disabled people, many terms, many debates about proper terminology, which has evolved over time. Uh, we can get into some of that later. But the notion of normalization is one that's very much accepted in the disability community of to, again, be part of the world, to be integrated into the world in a way that um, people are interacting in a normalized way. Now, it's not about fixing, and this is important. It's not about fixing or curing. Um, it's about accepting the disabled condition that it's a normal condition of life. And particularly with modern technology, disabled people are living longer, which is another thing you know, when I alluded to before the earlier deaths, people are living longer and expect to have fuller lives. We expect that as disabled people in society. And then one thing you didn't mention in your in introduction is that in my own experience, my uh, oldest son, oldest child had very serious disability from birth. Um, physical disabilities, as well as cognitive disabilities. Um, he lived to the age of 26, and that was a personal experience about um, 
trying to get the, the world as as um, available as possible for David and learning at the same time what the movement is about and what the expectations are. And 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 so I had this sort of both a personal and professional um, comprehension of it. I know I'm taking a long way to get to your to get to your uh, to answer your question, but you talked about social and economic rights. That's a big part of what life is about, right? Um, beginning with um, again back to this notion of normalization. What do we what do we expect in the world? We expect as children we want playtime, and then much of our lives as you're going through yourself, um, school. And I know that you've. Um, to look at your uh, video, you did your pilot episode and, and hear about your own personal experience from age seven to 17. Um, school informs a lot of it, right? There's school, extracurricular activities. And I know uh, you said in your case, you know, the importance of sports and how you transition from one sport to another. That's a big part of life. Friendships uh, are a really important part of life. So all this kind of comes again under the rubric of social. Um, and then as, as we all mature, um, there's expectations about earning one's livelihood. And here's where the economic rights come into play, making the workspaces available to people with disabilities. So we continue with some of the other things, the social aspects of lives, of our lives. Um, the, then there's the economic, the productivity in life, uh, and under the rubric of social, we also have sexual. And, you know, as an aside, let me say the long time kinds of stereotypes and taboo that people with disabilities are asexual or sometimes hypersexual is, is the notion that one sometimes ha has a people with like cognitive disabilities or mental health disabilities. But that's part of normalized life, too, is the ability to have a, a sexual life as well. And and then, you know, with aging we go into some of the same, uh, I think those sort of twin economic and social rights continue throughout a normalized life. And then we, we look at other kinds of conditions where people are slowing down in different ways, be, you know, retirement, stopping the economic, the economic aspect is less important. The social continues to be, and of course the medical aspect of life. And um, at that point, both disabled and non-disabled people tend to start to really share a lot of interests. That there's a line in the disability community that says eventually almost everyone becomes disabled. If they didn't acquire the disability or didn't have it from birth, they become. And then there's a lot of shared interests. Um, and when I say medical, I think it's important to point out that one of the things that contrasts the whole notion of rights, uh, what we say is the... Um, the rights model is moving away from the medical model or the charitable model, the model of pity. I think you talked a little bit about pity yourself in your uh, pilot episode. Um, the, the um, oh, the poor disabled person, um, the, uh, the notion of handicap, uh, that, that term which we tend to use anymore gives this notion again of pauper and the, the, the charity, the poverty aspect of it, the poor aspect of it, and the medical aspect of it, which again is about fixing and curing and repairing. And it's important, of course, to recognize uh, what the medical field can do in terms of, of assisting and improving one's condition. So it's not to let out, you know from your experience, again, the importance of what the medical profession can bring to it, but it's not, but the but it is important not to characterize people with disability or disability itself in this very medicalized way. We want to see it as centered um, and also to focus again on the, the the whole life and the integrated life. But so that's a broad way of answering your question, um, but it is um, to make sure that again, to, to make it a little more concrete that one can learn in an environment with others that one can uh, work in an environment with others, live in an environment with others. And um, and to do that requires some key principles are accommodation, what under United States law we refer to often as reasonable accommodation, but the notion of accommodation really is pretty international. And that's again, making sure that the, again, 
that one is able that the um, other people and the environment can accommodate that disability, which again may be different for the person with mobility issues as a person to the person with cognitive or intellectual issues, the person with mental health issues, learning issues. Accommodations are different. Another important concept is supports and services. So again, moving away from the um, medical model is about custodial care. We move more to the notion of support. How can we support disabled people to, to survive and thrive in that environment? And another equally important concept is the notion of least restrictive environment, which is again to um, to maximize the integration and inclusion, inclusivity of disabled people with others who are living in, in the world, whether it's again in a school, in a workplace setting, in a social setting, in an intimate relationship, in um, entertainment in um, uh, cultural activities. So I know it's kind of a long, long, broad thing that inspires me to do the advocacy and that I think uh, is movement at large. So Mr. Rosenbaum, you mentioned a lot about like the terminology of disability and how like it's sort of like overly like you know like medicalized or it makes it seem like disability is something that needs to be cured like what are your thoughts on that like how should we refer to people with disabilities because like in my experience whenever someone called me disabled you know I hated it you know like come on I'm not disabled like I can I can do whatever I want like so something like that but like is like is there like another term that we can use to like adequately sort of represent the struggle that disabled people go through in their lives, like not taking away like any of like, like the sort of like respect we have for like the disabled while also like, I don't know, kind of taking away some of like the stigma from that term. Like, do you have any ideas on like, like how, how we can better like refer to like the, the disabled people? That's a great question. It's something that's evolved over time. I like to look at how we've looked at other um, affiliations or identities. Think of, um, if you think in terms of race, how we've gone from colored to Negro to Afro-American to Black to African-American to Black again, so forth. It's something that's evolved over time. If you look at, um, and of course, there's the derogatory terms that have come with that as well, right? Where in polite society in the Southern part of this country, in the Jim Crow era, we had some really ugly terms when we were talking about Black people. Um, if you look at another evolution that uh, LGBT went from uh, queer to um, homosexual to gay, gay and lesbian to LGBT, and some brought back queer again, where queer got reclaimed as a, what was originally a pejorative term. So there's no, there's no, um, no one answer. My own view on this is you have to look to the community to define, people have, have the right to define that, and there won't necessarily be unanimity. Um, you talked about fighting the stigma. There are people who right, don't want to identify as disabled to say that um, because of a stigmatizing term. Um, with children particularly, this comes up a lot where parents like to say a special needs child. The term of our, in our legislation though, our national legislation and state, like the federal government has the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the IDEA. The term of art is student with disabilities, right? But some people say, mm, don't like that. And again, I respect the right of people to choose the terms they want. Uh, some, for a while, people talked about differently abled, physically challenged. And I guess there's some terms that the disability community, if you will, if there's any unanimity at all and not on everything, some people say, mm -hmm. That's a little too euphemistic. So again, I think it's important that people to choose their labels and it may not be in, in line with what other people say, even though there's generally like a certain level of acceptance. And I just want to give you one more example on the, on the language front, because this is something I think about and write about a lot. Uh, it does evolve and it does vary. Um, for instance, there are people who insist, when I used to work with Disability Rights California, the term was person with disability people with disabilities. It's a people first term, right? You focus on the humanity over the disability. 
I think that's what you're saying about your own identity of that. That's, you know, you are not the disability, you are this person. And yet at the same time, there's been a little bit of a swing back to what was an earlier term, which is disabled person, which for a while was perfectly fine. Uh, but I had colleagues that said, no, no, we don't use that. And I'm like, wait, why not? And it, it turns out that in more recent years, a lot of activists in the disability community, they say, wait, I'm an identity first person. I'm a disabled person. <laughs> now, they don't necessarily um, counter the person with a disability, but there's like, that's how I want to identify. So, and again, there's no right or wrong. Like a lot of people, uh, who's the non, a lot of people like prefer the term disabled and non-disabled. They're not like this normal person, but you could say person without disabilities, or you could say non-disabled person. So like a whole discussion in itself, and even within the sort of mental health, mental illness, psychiatric, social disability area, you have even like more debates about terminology. So when you ask what's the one answer and, and what is it, it's only it's only good enough for a certain threshold number and only for now. But I think you're generally safe with disabled person, disabled persons, person with a disability. And I'll say one more thing, when you start getting into other languages, like Spanish, which you know is very prevalent in California, there are a lot of very negative terms, valido and uh, discapacitado and so forth. Um, and now the term is persona con, con persona con discapacidad, which translates as person with disability, not with a disability or disabilities, person with disability. So it's going it, it, to vary. And the other thing is you have to not only honor what people want to refer to themselves, but respect a community and speak to the language that people know, where it's a culture or subgroup, if you will, just becoming accustomed to discussing with it, you have to use terms that are understandable. And at the same time, uh, I think point out what might be considered pejorative. Yeah. So long-winded answer to your question, but that, that's the way I look at that. Yeah. And I mean, if I had to take one thing from your response, it would be taking, putting like the humanity, like ahead of the term, like there is no one size fits all for referring to people with disabilities, just because like, I guess like disability is such like a wide reaching term, like it can apply to so many people. So putting the humanity ahead, like putting the person's human dignity at the forefront is the most important, like, I guess, way to like refer to people with disabilities. So in your, yeah. If I may, I think you're right. And dignity is a, is a very important concept. And, and if I may, on this note, one of the things about the modern disability rights movement, it is broad. Again, intellectual, psychosocial, physical, mobility, communication, hearing, sight. Um, it, that's what distinguishes the modern movement from historic movements, the war veterans, the maimed war vet, the injured war veterans, the blind, the deaf and hard of hearing. So it is a broad movement. Not that everyone always has the same interests <laughs> or that there's not some conflicts in terms of accommodations, but, but that is what characterizes the current disability movement. Yeah. So in our, in, in like your previous like response, like we talked a lot about like what like disability rights would kind of like look like, you know, like conditions in the workplace, like the, you know, right to, I guess, like play sports in my case, like I always wanted an equal opportunity to play sports, I guess the right to an education, like what policies will actually help these children get equal opportunities in education and get like those kind of basic needs of like workplace or, you know, getting, get like having the ability to play sports, like what policies will get these basic needs taken care of? Well, in many areas, and work is one, and education definitely, in the United States, we have some very good um, federal, national legislation, laws, and at the state level, often um, one mirroring the other and very overlapping concepts. Sometimes the state may be a little more generous than the federal. The important federal legislation is the Americans with uh, Disabilities Act, the ADA, enacted in 1990. And then we have beginning in the mid 1970s, actually, um, the what's now called what I said earlier, the IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, initially called All Children Handicapped Act, something to that extent, is very specific. That's very specific to the educational sphere. The ADA is more general, and I can 
and get to that. So in education, when we're really talking from kindergarten or pre-kindergarten all the way through high school, there are um, some very clear, it's more than just policy, some very clear um, laws and regulations which uh, have been litigated over time, which are very specific to, um, to again, bling, uh, children with disabilities, students with disabilities, special needs children and youth to go through the system. There's sort of a key, couple key concepts. And most, most people are familiar with the term IEP, the Individual Education Program. That's what drives it. Every child um, from, like I say, preschool age up through high school, and by the way, high school in some cases can mean 12th grade plus four more years. The state really has responsibility, school districts, to um, educate children and youth through the age of 22 in California, some other states even further. It doesn't mean you're sitting in the classroom for 12th grade, four years. It means that transition to post high school life, whether it's uh, university, jobs, uh, social situations, and so forth. So the, the IEP says, each child is entitled to an individual educational program, which is worked out between the family and the school district in, in a series of meetings and then memorialized, put on paper. Uh, it can be a not always an easy discussion. Sounds better in theory than always in practice. And by the way, I think every child should have an individualized education plan, not just disabled children. I think that would be good. Um, and what, guy, what drives that program is uh, it's everything from the various accommodations and supports. Um, will there be a physical therapy? You're familiar with physical therapy in your Gosh, situation. Yeah. Eight years of my that life. Can that can come in in the school environment. Occupational therapy, a lot of overlap in the kinds of therapy that are there. Um, speech and language services. It may mean accommodations like taking more time on an exam, uh, delay in turning in assignments, the instructional mode, all of that, what kind of classroom? And 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 what at the end of the day, the district has a responsibility to offer a child a free, appropriate public education. Free, appropriate public education, or FAPE is the acronym. The hard word there is the A word. That's the hard word. What's appropriate? School district would say one thing maybe, and the family says something else. So the fight often is about that. Although it's supposed to be what I said earlier about the least restrictive environment. In other words, this is a more modern concept since I'd say about the 1960s or 70s. We don't put the student with disability off in that bungalow at the end of the playground or a separate school somewhere else, back to this notion of hiding and putting away. Um, they should be in a regular classroom with what we say are their typically developing peers, other kids of the same age, right? That's where you start. And then you only move from that to the extent that that's not feasible. You can get into the reasons for that if you want, but that now is the norm. Now, the reality is many youngsters are still, children and youth in this country and certainly around the world are still educated in a separate classroom. Um, less the bungalow way behind, or some other institution somewhere away, uh, but nonetheless segregated. And a lot of the, the, again, the modern disability rights movement and education looks to the analogy with the civil rights movement in terms of racial justice, where no, separate but equal is not okay, we know, when it comes to race. And so the same is true of disability. Being in a separate or segregated section session is not going to, um, enhance uh, one's educational uh, progress. And yet there will be instances where the accommodations and supports in the regular classroom just may not be feasible for reasons you know we can get into. So again, I know I've, I've taken a long time to answer your question. <laughs> no, that's, uh, yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. And I think one thing that really like, I guess like sort of stuck with me was like this like idea about like the IDEA like like how it like attempts to provide like support and resources for people with disabilities in the United States however though you've also authored 
um, or co-authored several interesting papers on like, you know, how the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, sort of like fails families that are low income, um, who have children who have like, who have disabilities and are marginalized by poverty, like language or immigration status. And they're, they're really not reaping like the benefits that like the IDEA promised. So can you talk about like how like we as a society can like sort of like overcome um, it's like some of these like failures on like the part of the IDEA? Yeah, I, I think that points to the fact that where it's a great law on paper, like other great laws yeah. in practice, in implementation and application and enforcement, it, it, it can fail. The first step in legislation is to have good drafting, good laws, and then make it work. And unfortunately, uh, what's happened a lot in the IDA context, and, and one could say at large, one of the failures of our legal system, if you will, because this is a legalized process, even though it doesn't always end up in the courtroom, um, having advocate uh, costs money, a lawyer often cost money. And that's where we begin to separate people on the basis of of income and wealth. And so if you're going into a process without having that lawyer or advocate, and the advocate being a very well-trained person who maybe doesn't have a law degree, can do a lot of things, uh, particularly in the educational context, um, you're already at a bit of a disadvantage. And then, of course, if you go in without the lawyer or advocate, and you have no knowledge of the law, then you're at an even further advantage. So you start with the person who knows nothing to the person who's informed but without an advocate to the person who's got that advocate and attorney. And you're going to have um, not always, but in many cases, that that inability to pay is going to mean you're not going to be able to kind of get all that you want. And, and all that you want, I might add, this may seem counterintuitive, but the, this notion of FAPE, free appropriate public education, doesn't necessarily entitle you to optimizing potential, maximizing potential. You, you think it would. It's really about just reaching a certain level of being able to master the state standards for a particular grade level um, to uh, passing you know, uh, from grade to grade, making enough progress from grade to grade. It's a kind of a pretty weak... It's a pretty weak and kind of fuzzy standard. Um, and that that's what makes it difficult too. So I think, again, the people without the advocacy support um, are going to be less capable of getting what they should be getting in the school. You, we, you know the adage, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Well, this happens also in the IEP context. Some Sometimes the child well-equipped and is um, has that support and parental support or guardian support is obviously very important. Um, we'll get those kinds of accommodations or supports that are necessary. And the child doesn't have that kind of power, the advocacy power or political power, if you will, is going to be more disadvantaged. You ask how we've improved that as a society. Uh, to some extent, I know the work that I've done in my organizations has been to represent people without regard to their ability to pay. In fact, prioritizing people who are low income uh, to make sure that they get that kind of counsel and representation as needed. And this is true of other spheres. And we didn't talk yet about employment, for instance, to ask earlier, the workspace, um, they were focusing just on education. The same principle can be true there as well, that you need to have the, the good laws and then the knowledge of them and then someone to be there supporting that kind of advocacy and then staying on top once you have the advocacy. Because once you have a great IEP, you know, maybe it's 20 pages and you met for five hours. And by the way, I don't think that size matters when it comes to that. OK, I think you want a, you want an IEP that's manageable, that's easy to implement. And you want a reasonable time to meet and a reasonably good uh, relationship between school and family. Um, then if you got the right people there and you've got some some mutual trust then the other stuff matters less including the money part of it a goodwill goes goes far on both ends to making things really happen and of course good teachers in the process because we focus on the school administrator and the family but in between are those teachers and therapists um and specialists who are 
providing that specialized instruction and education. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like, like even for myself, and I attend a private school. It was very difficult to get, you know, the accommodations I needed. Like the problem, my mom had to call doctors to get um, my neurologist to get like the necessary paperwork. They weren't doing it. Called again, necessary paperwork over like the span of like, I think it took me like something like four months to get like the accommodations I I needed in order to, you know, be able to, like, kind of like accomplish things at school. So I can only imagine if. My parents maybe struggle with English or um, we don't have the resources, like maybe insurance to go to like a good neurologist. Like imagine, I, I guess I'm sort of like imagining the sort of difficulty that kind of like comes with trying to get these accommodations. And that I think that's why like your work is so important. So I kind of want to get into your work as a senior attorney with Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund and with Disability Rights California. So could you tell us a little bit more about your litigation experience and what our audience can like sort of learn from these experiences. Yeah, let, before I do that, let me comment on some important things you just mentioned there, because you did say earlier and came back to this notion of language, right, language again is going to be another barrier for people for whom English is a second language just on the knowledge part or communicating with their lawyers or communicating with the school district, despite the requirements to have interpretation and translation. Immigration status, if the parents are undocumented, less willingness to take certain risks in terms of, you know, pushing the system, wanting to kind of push too far. And this notion of having um, medical or specialist um, reports, they're, as you know, they're expensive to get, to have those consult visits and consultations, and then the write-up that follows the consultation, which can, in many instances, inform the kinds of accommodations that a student needs. Final thing I'll say, private versus public. You talk about private private schools uh, don't have the same obligation to public schools. Uh, there's many instances where the private, including parochial schools, are required to do certain things when they get public monies. Um, and these days, we are seeing private institutions know that from a what, moral or a pragmatic standpoint to uh, cater, if you will, to their clientele, they need to uh, be able to look at those uh, necessary accommodations and and provide them, even if they don't um, uh, have the the legal responsibility obligation to always do so. Um, the work I did with a number of years with different disability rights organizations, nonprofits, as I said earlier, clients did not pay. Um, we covered a wide range of um, of issues in addition to education. To say we worked on people being able to get accommodations at their jobs. Um, a big area of disability, which a lot of progress has been made over time, disability rights, it's getting into public spaces. and Well, actually, private facilities that are open to the public. Stores, health clubs, get to gyms and so forth. Get, we can come back to your kind of sports uh, activities in, in a minute. Um, hotels, restaurants. You know, in the classic, going back to the analogy of the civil rights movement, the racial justice movement, the key was um, Blacks were prevented from going into hotels and restaurants and clubs and so forth. Uh, once the law said, no, you have to admit people of color, you have to admit people regardless of their race or ethnic origin to these various facilities, which again are private facilities, because uh, that used to be a long time. Oh, no, I don't need to let you into this club or this place is private. And the law said, no, no, no. Um, you need to sell your house to people irrespective of their race. You need to let them into that restaurant and so forth. But the difference was once the law said open the doors, um, then the doors were open. And the only barrier at that point really was, was payment, right? An expensive restaurant, expensive hotel, a club membership. Okay, and that's one of the things the civil rights movement didn't deal with, the economic right. In the disability context, it's not as easy to say um, open that restaurant unless there's a ramp to get into it for the wheelchair user, or the doors are wide enough, or the menu is going to be um, with a large enough font on it for the person who's who has a visual impairment, or for the ability of a person who's deaf or hard of hearing to place that order in the restaurant. Now, it doesn't mean in all cases that the restaurant has to hire, you know, a full-time 
ASL interpreter or has to have all menus available in different fonts or has to provide a Braille menu. It doesn't always mean that. Certain things are expected. We know the easy stuff like the grab bars in the bathrooms, the wide doorways, stairways. There have to be entrances that are on, on um, ramps and so forth, elevators in tall buildings. Um, so this is what distinguishes the disability, uh, civil and human rights, if you will, from, again, race-based, uh, race, religion, ethnicity, um, because it does require that accommodation. And it's important to know that whereas the um, um, motivation should always be to make that access, there are instances where the, uh, the law understands what's called an undue burden or undue hardship. For instance, um, you can't necessarily, not all buildings without elevators are necessarily going to be accessible. So sometimes like in a school, back to the school setting workplace, you move things down to the first floor, a classroom, an office, and so forth. Um, there's other things that are more nuanced on that where there is what's called that, again, that defense on the part of the building owner or the operator uh, to basically say it's not possible in this instance to do it. So you look for other kinds of accommodations. But I know I'm um, sort of deviating a little bit from your question about the nature of the work, but what we did in, in the work that I had with uh, Disability Rights California, which I think is again, an excellent organization in California and throughout the nation, there are counterparts of what's called the protection and advocacy system. Each state has its own um, disability rights organization. And we have more than those in California, more than just Disability Rights California. Um, the earlier group I worked with, Disability Rights Education Defense Fund model on the NAACP model for Blacks, MALDEF model for uh, Latinos, and the ALDEF model for Asian Americans, not Asian Americans, but Asians living in the country. Um, the, um, again, it's free to the clients, taking on both large issues, what we call impact issues, but also individual risk cases. And it's difficult when you're in that kind of environment. Yes, it's good that we don't charge our clients money, but it's also sometimes we play God in deciding what issues to take up, right? You can only serve so many people who's deserving of representation. What are the big issues? And there it's important to look overall to the various stakeholders to have conversations and focus groups and constantly be paying attention to the needs of the community. What does the community say it wants? You asked a question earlier about nomenclature. What do we call people with disabilities? Um, you're not always gonna get the same answer to that, nor will you necessarily to the needs. And part of it again comes back to the needs of people with communication. Disabilities may be different from the cognitive and intellectual and so forth. So you have to be aware of kind of listening to the various constituencies, stakeholders, and trying to um, look for ways to, again, um, accommodate great. And I'll say one more thing about what the nature of the work. It's not always about litigation, uh, suing. It, it should never really always be about uh, lawsuits. You look a lot for mediation, negotiated settlements, you look for policy, and often that's, um, you mentioned policy earlier, there's kind of soft policy, um, guidelines, instructions, guidance, and then policy, what, what does the legislature enact? What does Congress enact? Um, you can make change often through that forum as much as, or sometimes more than, uh, in, the, in the courtroom. Yeah. So you mentioned a little bit about sort of like policy that, you know, say like Congress passes or something like that. And I want to like dig into that a little bit. Like what exactly do we think is like sort of needed? Like, for example, in like universities or sports teams or schools, like is the right thing to do like to reserve a certain amount of spots for like disabled individuals? I mean, that could get kind of complicated, especially if people are like, hey, I don't want my disability to be, you know, like a defining part of my personality. So like why, why are schools and work do places doing that? But then on the other hand, schools and university sports teams, they also need to kind of like, I guess, take into account that it may be more difficult to, I don't know, kind of um, have like build up your resume in the same way that um, other other um, sort of able individuals are like able to do. So like, what is, 
like I guess like what is like the sort of right policy or like is there even a right policy for um like disability inclusion into like some sort of into like all these like organizations and like workplaces and sports teams and schools that like surround us yeah well that again uh, a really interesting array of questions and um and responses for one thing i'm glad you mentioned that about higher education so after the high school years and as i say that may be you know 12th grade plus certain periods where the school district is kind of the clearinghouse for a number of services and supports and arranging that transition ideally seamless between high school and post high school life the idea no longer applies at that point then once you're at the university college level we look to the more generalized law on um, education, in part the ADA, and in part something that predates the IDA, which is something called the Rehabilitation Act. And there's a section of it, Section 504, that preceded the ADA. And it said, when federal funding is involved, or federally later federally operated entities, and almost everything has federal funding these days, then these principles that we've been talking about apply. So it started there and then moved to the private sector for the private facilities um, and workplaces and so forth. Um, but there, the it's, a, it's a little bit of a lower bar. Uh, a reasonable accommodation, um, a student in a uh, first year, second year class at the university will not necessarily get all the supports and services as part of that individualized education program that he or she would have gotten in high school or earlier. It's a, it's a softer standard, um, still an accommodation that's required. And um, again, to be able to participate in the activity. Um, and in more recent years, universities and colleges have beefed up their various offices for disabled student programs and so forth to kind of help that process to negotiate between student and faculty to make sure that's happened. And I think we're finding more robust kinds of things, note takers, again, more time on exams, um, uh, delayed assignments or more time to complete an assignment, adapting the assignments themselves. So there is recognition in the sports area, uh, recognition of the need for accommodations in the sports arena, that, that becomes its own its own kind of entity because as you as you you've got at the college and university level, you have, you know, various, you know, you've got the NCAA and you've got the, um, you have the, you know, for, for baseball and for football and all the various sports and athletic activities, you've got um, national associations which govern those activities. Now, I think as a society, we're in more recent years, we've been more preoccupied with the issue of gender when it comes to, to um, sports and so forth and interpreting who gets to play, who doesn't get to play, who's female, who's male, who's neither, what, what's fair in that. So the notion of fairness comes to play, um, and that's murky. When it comes to disability, um, I think, you know, uh, when you're talking about varsity sports, it's going to be very hard in a lot of cases for the person who uh, is not able to meet the kind of standard requirements to participate. Um, and part of the argument is, I mean, one of the defenses is um, in disability law is um, the undue hardship. If the accommodation requested fundamentally alters the nature itself, you know, I, a student should be able to play on a football team using when no other member of that team is, no other member of the other team is using a wheelchair. That's going to fundamentally alter, to require that accommodation to be met will fundamentally alter the nature of that sport that it can't happen. Now, a couple of things to be said about that. I think we know that the movement of para Paralympics and um, wheelchair basketball, for instance, and all kinds of sports, almost every sport exists, whether it's spectator or individual, team or individual, has a cadre of people who are participating, uh, notwithstanding disabilities. And that means adapting the sport itself. Um, that's one area where this happens now, but that doesn't mean playing on the varsity team or the junior varsity team, right? But certainly the various intramural teams or other kinds of activities, you're going to find those kind of accommodations made. And again, not necessarily just, okay, this is for disabled student sports, this is others. 
there are accommodations made in regular activities. I don't know. And I know rowing is something that's that's important to you. You've managed to be participate in that with a disability. Um, it, 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 it can, it, you're kind of in, in between, if you will, right? You're not, as I understand it, you're not rowing in a disabled team. And you were telling me uh, be, before we uh, began this interview today about prospects of being on a college sport difficulties there for the reason I said, in terms of what standards need to be met about the activity itself. So it's it's complicated. It's again, one of the things I didn't mention earlier, it's very about this accommodation notion. There's no one size fits all, as you said before. Um, and that doesn't just mean, okay, blah, Blind people get this, deaf people get this, um, people with mobility impairments. It means even that individual accommodation is negotiated and it's supposed to be an interactive process. Um, so you may come in with a certain idea about how it's to be done and the manager or the employer, whoever that other person on the other side is, may say, well, we can do this, but not that. This happens a lot with um, people who are hard of hearing. Not everyone gets an ASL interpreter 24 seven. Sometimes it's note taking, sometimes it's other kinds of um, communication, captioning and so forth. So it's um, an interactive process. Again, easier said than done. It, it doesn't always accomplish, um, we can't always get the application, the implementation that we'd like to see envisioned in the legislation. Yeah. And I think if I had to take like, you know, like one big thing away from that, it's all about, you know, people working together and like being open about your disability with, you know, whoever you're working with, I guess, because um, if we're able to like kind of, I don't know, negotiate and like combine, um, combine thinking together, like there's usually like a solution, even if it's always not like, like the best case, you know, solution, like, like you said, not everyone's able to have an ASL interpreter on them at all times, but there are solutions that you can, I guess, co like come to like note taking, et cetera. I, I agree with you. I think that that kind of communication is important, particularly back to the IEP process. Mediation is a really good way for things to happen. And um, it's um, it's it's a good attitude to begin with, to kind of to listen to each other, I think is very important. And I will say one other thing, you alluded to this earlier, a person has a right to disclose or not to disclose a disability, not just the identity label, but to disclose it. Not everyone has that ability, to, but we have the invisible disabilities of mental health or learning disabilities. So a person's not required to, but if they have it and want to engage in that process, then there should be the, the, the respect and ability to do that. Mr. Rosenbaum, your work defending disability rights and your teaching about disability studies at schools like Berkeley, University of Washington, and Stanford helps fight against discrimination towards people with disabilities in our society. Your hard work developing policies to help severely disabled children who are among the most marginalized and vulnerable people inspires our generation. Your dedication to improving the lives of disabled people through your work on rights and education is really, really admirable. Thank you, Mr. Rosenbaum, for joining us on the NeuroStronger podcast and for making this interview possible. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. Well, you're very kind, Vishnu. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the work that you're doing um, to this enterprising podcast. Thanks so much. Glad to be here.